This is The Dime, a 10-minute dive into the cannabis and hemp industry through trends, insights, predictions, and tangents. What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Dime. As always, I've got my right-hand man, Kellen Finney, here with me. And this week, we have a special guest, John Shute from Puff Creative. John, welcome to The Dime. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It is an honor and an absolute pleasure to be on The Dime. Well, we appreciate that. I think for our <laughs> listeners, you recently won a couple of awards. I think it's important that A, you're congratulated for them, and B, I think maybe talk a little bit about, you know, your background in the space, what Puff brings to the table, and, and how you kind of won those awards. Yeah, man. We're just hitting it hard right from the start. Um, we did just win two awards. Um, my agency, Puff Creative, we won the Agency of the Year. Um, and I won marketer of the year through ad cannabis, which is like a cannabis specific marketing agency directory in Canada and the United States. Um, we were up against some of the top agencies in the country, uh, at world, let alone at this point and, um, people who have also won in previous years. Uh, so that really, really felt good. You know, it's really, I was like, so eager, like, I'm not, I actually voted for like other people to win marketer of the year. But I'm really excited that we did win uh, both because you know, I totally had put a lot of time in the past four years to the industry and trying to not only change hearts and minds about cannabis, but also actually make changes in our communities. Um, and I think that that's just you know, going to be a, like a moral of my story and moral of this podcast is going to be just that. You know, I'm so proud of my team, what we've been able to accomplish in four years. Um, we've, I think we're almost over like 250K raised for nonprofits all over the country the past few years. Um, we were able to launch, help launch our own nonprofit, uh, co-founded with our partners at Cannabis Doing Good in Kind, Colorado. Um, and we're in the middle of launching a series of guide campaigns with all the different nonprofits and organizations we work with. Uh, for example, we, we just released a mental health guide um, as like a framework, but we're going to be doing like an opiate awareness guide, uh, anti-racism guide, uh, stoner survival guide. Uh, all of these guides are going to be digestible content for people to share with their family, their friends on social media. Uh, and all these efforts are going to be, you know, going funding different nonprofits. Um, so a lot of really great programs that we've worked on, a lot of really cool things that we're planning. And that's kind of why I'm so excited that we've won. And like, I hope that, you know, all these other agencies that are out there who are crushing it, you know, I hope that they, can incorporate that similar mindset in their business and like their development and encourage their clients to do these like important community aspects. <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of leads into, I mean, be prior to Puff Creative, um, I was, let's see, I, I grew up in a restaurant. My parents were in the restaurant growing up and my mom, my mother was a, a childhood cancer survivor. Um, so my whole life, my parents incorporated, uh, giving back into their business. Uh, my mom runs a foundation right now that benefits the children's hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, and we actually like help host her site and the little things that she's like working on. I think things are scaling down or a bit more difficult in the type of climate we live in. But anyway, that kind of like was embedded in like my blood, like growing up, you know, I, I noticed that my parents did that from like very early on. Um, and I was, I became really intrigued with like project management and marketing. Like right, I got a master's degree in project management and I was, very, I was like really proud of myself for that. Cause I was so engaged into the program and like, I loved project management and I had an opportunity right out of the gate to become the marketing and operations manager of a nightclub, um, which is pretty interesting. Uh, I'm not really a nightclub guy, but I was kind of thrown in this environment that I, kind of stood out like a sore thumb and like from a marketing perspective that actually worked. Um, it was right around the time when Snapchat first came out prior to the Instagram story, which is like a huge marketing tool these days. And like Facebook and Twitter are doing it now and TikTok. And um, so I was able to, I, I realized through Snapchat, the value of telling a story through social marketing rather than just like a split instant, you know, post like Instagram, like it used to literally people used it as Instagram. Um, you yeah, know, now it's like this crazy marketing tool. Um, and same thing with the other social platforms. So I just learned all this really crazy marketing strategy and approaching a business from like an outside perspective 
and how much of an impact that can actually have. So I was able to apply all my project management skills to that in such a unique setting. Um, at the same time, I just didn't really feel fulfilled doing that. Um, I felt like I was kind of, yeah, I thought I did some great things, but I did feel like I was wasting like my potential in a way and just getting wrapped up in nightlife. I'm sure I could let your mind's race on that. Yeah, that's actually how I got involved in cannabis, like right around the same time as I the two things happened as I just it, it became more important in my life. So I was like living alone at the time, long distance from my uh, fiance, uh, now wife, soon to be mother, my baby, uh, baby girl. Um, but, you know, I just was going through some weird mental stuff and it really helped me. And I had a bunch of friends struggling with opiates at the time. And, uh, you know, the cannabis is helping them. I did a bunch of research on how it's helping other people with PTSD and other type of addictive you know symptoms and withdrawal and yeah i just put my two weeks in one day and was like i'm gonna, i'm moving back home i'm gonna apply to a cannabis job and i did on indeed.com it was the only cannabis job that popped up in the search i don't know how it popped up as a marketing director it was like a marketing job i was like what so i applied got the gig um and it was for a contract manufacturer out of california which is a crazy state uh six years ago in cannabis um, and, um, still is, <laughs> but really crazy then when I first got involved and, um, they had in-house brands as well. So I was marketing their like B2B side of their business and then also marketing the brands that they had in-house and then learning about all the intimate relationships that are involved from a B2B and B2C perspective to get products on shelves, source raw materials, you know, educate bud tenders, educate the consumer, you know. So I was like just thrown into this, into exactly what I needed to be thrown into, to, you know, really lead to where I'm at now. Um, so sorry, I'm just like rambling on here. I got a lot to talk about. Um, but uh, anyway, like I did that for a, a, a probably six months or so, and I was not getting reciprocated fairly. You know, I was promised this long-term job. Um, and it was like a month before I got, and my, I had an intern at the time. She was also helping me and she was promised a long-term job. She quit her other job um, for this. And like a month before I got married, like right when they told us they were gonna like solidify our long-term contracts, they were like, sorry, um, which was now looking back pretty standard for the industry then uh, for something like that to happen. Um, and at the moment thought it was the worst thing that could possibly happen to me, but let alone it was the best thing that possibly happened to me. Um, so instead of like, I was definitely down the dumps, but like, instead of like, putting my tail between my legs, I started Puff Creative. You know, I brought my intern on as a business partner. We brought in my other business partner, Seamus, who was kind of on the web, kind of like photo side of things. Uh, we were more on like the social email strategy. Um, and yeah, we just turned it into, into a, a business. And um, through the connections I made through that other job, we were able to start out with just two really solid clients and who are still clients today. And um, we just kind of, I was able to turn a really shitty situation into a good one. Um, so I'm really, really grateful for that. And really, really like, can't even believe that I'm even telling this stuff on a podcast right now, to be honest with you. Because being from New Jersey, I know you guys are from the East too. Like, I never thought in my lifetime this would be my reality. So I think that covers <laughs> most of the, what, the, what, you, what you're going for there. Yeah, it's an it's an incredible story, and I think it's even more admirable of all the the giving back and, and the true nature and the genuinity of the way you present yourself and and the way you make that a primary focus. And I think it's a really incredible way to proceed. And I I I think most people would benefit from even doing the smallest tidbit of the the giving back that you do. And I think. Um, from Cal and I's perspective, we love kind of admiring what you're doing and continue to watch you guys continue to grow and thrive. Oh man, thanks. And vice versa, you guys are huge. You guys are pushing um, the industry as well. And it's like, you got to give respect to where it's due because it, like, this is it. Like this is prime time right now for cannabis and hemp. Like this is the most important time for us to be preaching these, these good words and informing people about all this critical information. Cause you know, prior to the podcast, we were just talking about like the, what's going on in DC right now with cannabis and hemp is insane. Like we're about to see more change than we've ever seen in the next year than I've seen since I got in the industry six years ago, um, which I didn't think was possible. But, you know, if you talk to me, I think 
this might have been something we talked about when you guys were on my podcast, but I think we were all like, yeah, it's probably going to be a few years before things unfold. And now I'm like, wow, like it could be like to, by, before my baby's born, <laughs> like in seven <laughs> weeks, like we could find out a lot of information. Right. You know, not, that, not that like it's going to take a while, but it's, it's interesting. Like it's interesting being in the industry. It's interesting being an educator, a marketer and not knowing, like, I honestly thought I kind of knew what was going to happen. And now I'm like, don't hundred percent know like what the future holds for the industry, but I, I have high hopes and I'm, and I totally am not going to stop doing what I'm doing. So you can quote me on that. <laughs> for sure. So, so today we're going to have a, a different style for a podcast. We're going to take a more kind of pop culture approach. And from the marketing perspective, Kellen, I'm going to start with you. Cannabis. What's your first thought when you close your eyes from like a TV reference, movie, commercial? What's your first thought with that? Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> God, John? I love Snoop Dogg. I like the music. Uh, I feel like it's tough going second because now my brain's thinking of Snoop Dogg, too. <laughs> Honestly, what's weird, I, so I, I tried to, like, I guess the first thing, like, when you asked him that popped in my brain was Dare. For some reason, oh, sure. that's, yeah, that was like the first exposure. The I'm like, we like in Jersey, like South Southern New Jersey. It's like, weed. You'll go to you'll go to jail for that. It's the devil's life. You're gonna ruin your life. You can't think on that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think they have there anymore, right? That's 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 gotta I don't be. Know. Yeah, that has to be a changed program because they can't really be preaching marijuana is bad. But literally going to New Jersey, they're like, by the way, it's adult use. So if you're 18 or yeah, 21, no problem. It's yeah, it's essential during a pandemic, but people are still in jail for it. So let's not confuse the children. Yeah, they had dare when I was, they had dare when I was back in grad school because I know me and my buddies all got dare shirts as uh, trying to be a positive influence, right? So we all wore dare shirts to our homecoming in college <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was like i feel like there yeah like i think we're on the same age like it was almost like i i remember when that was like a thing like i think i wore like some dare shirts and it was kind of like you're it's kind of like you're a little badass if you wore a dare shirt out out you know it's like <laughs> it's totally right. that you, it's like you're trying to show the message but like you're also like kind of like a rebel against it and that's why you're <laughs> it's like a joke or something what is, <laughs> what does dare stand for um Drug awareness, resistance, education, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Phew. Man, it Phew. didn't stick with me, but yeah, yeah in, that's it. <laughs> in case they want to jumpstart Dare 2.0, Kellen's obviously learned a lot, remembered a lot, and used that for value. So, Ke Kellen. And I have a shirt, so. Yeah, there's no <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't have mine still. I'm going to have to, like, try to dig that up. I, th I think my my stigma with cannabis and the way I always remember it is like the guy on the couch, right? Like the guy who's like the long hair and he doesn't really have a job and he just kind of like sinks into the couch. And for the longest part of my college life, that literally was the type of cannabinoid experience that I had. And I think that stigma is what I'm going to make a generalization. A majority of the United States thinks of when they think of cannabis and from a marketing sense, how does that change? How do we do a better job of educating the masses on the stigma, the medicinal benefits? Like, how, how does that start, John? Yeah, that's like the best question ever. Um, it starts in so many different places, I've realized. And I think the first place it starts from a marketing perspective. And this is what, what I'm most intrigued about with the industry is that every single person that you talk to about cannabis and how it impacts their life and has changed it has a different story. Um, so when you're talking about like marketing a brand, even from a B2B or B2C perspective at this point, pulling apart that story and like why people got involved in the industry is probably like the most important thing. And then second is tying that story to a give back or CSR program that aligns with the reason they got involved and the change that they're like really trying to make. Um, we did a campaign right when we started cannabis doing good, like two years ago, two and a half years ago. Time is weird now. Um, what? It's like, oh yeah, 2020 that happened. Um, <laughs> it's like, I can't believe it's like February. Uh, anyway, um, we did, we did this really cool campaign uh, a few years back and it's on the cannabis doing good website. And we uh, did a short clip of like 60 different people, all different ages, all different backgrounds, all different cultures, all different ethnicities. And they stated why, like how they use cannabis for doing good. And it was like PTSD, 
drug abuse. They help give money like they that they use cannabis to help feed the homeless at their church. Like we're talking to priests about how when you take it down to how deep that this that it goes um, and how it changes hearts and minds, like that's exactly how. And another part for me as a marketer is like, how do you translate that into content? Um, how do you make that content compliant? Especially because like a lot of times cannabis has changed people's lives because of health <laughs> concerns uh, and health issues. And, you know, you, you have to be careful about how you market that type of verbiage. Um, so that's a huge part of our strategy too, is like figuring out how to tell the brand story and the organization story properly and let that resonate in the community efforts as well. And then how are we sharing that story properly and like monetizing and making sure that that's strategic and how we get that out there. Um, you know, something, you know, like we're, what we're doing right now, a podcast, that's like literally one of the best ways to get information out there and have consistent content for any brand. Um, but we struggle because not everyone wants to do a podcast or has time for it. And I totally respect that, but it's, it's a great option. And if like, you know, you want to see an increased trend in traffic to your site and, you know, have social media content and run a great campaign and get people engaged with the people behind the organization, what better way? Um, and we were talking about before too, sorry, I'm bringing up like pre podcast talk, but um, we were talking about like, like I just recently switched my podcast to a video. Um, and why did I do that? Because yes, it's a great SEO tool, YouTube and having video, but video really like seeing the face, it really does translate with people more. Um, when you see people, the different people we've talked to in this video that we created, and I can send you guys a link to share with this podcast or whatever. Um, yeah. but it, it really is like life changing. And that's why I'm, I'm most intrigued about marketing. Anyone is telling their story. Um, cause that's really what's going to change hearts and minds. Um, and then that translates into it. What you will see, the more you can do that and tell that story as a brand that will translate into an ROI. You will start seeing sales and brand recognition and brand loyalty. There's no better way to get those things. Um, when brands don't realize that or like have that realization and they're in it for the wrong reasons, um, it's way harder to market and it's way harder to see a return on like your investments when that's the case. Um, not saying it's the case for everyone. I'm definitely some really successful piece of shit brands out there. I'll say it very bluntly. Um, <laughs> but that's not the case I want to see for the industry. You know, I know you guys are in the same boat. So I hope that answers your question. I, I think... <laughs> Definitely. Kellen, do you want yeah. to take a spin on the marketing perspective? I know it's a slightly different approach for you, but I'd be intrigued to hear your opinion. No, I mean, it's totally outside of my wheelhouse for sure, but you know, I'm not afraid. I'll take a swing at it. And I think John said, said it really well in terms of kind of like trying to tell that story. And the biggest thing with the stigma is the negative connotations that people associate cannabis with. And you make a great point when you can see someone else's face. It creates trust. Right. And that's why I think there's a huge difference between this is why television beat out radio. Right. Back yeah. in the day, because it was just so much more engaging and people ended up trusting what they, cause they could see the individual that was providing that information. And so those and stories, we're seeing the downfall of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's circle, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that, I think that's the key is like, making it closer to home for everyone, right? If uh, yeah, yeah. you don't have any friends that have ever partaked in cannabis or used it for medicinal benefits and you're kind of out here on this island and the only information you're making your opinion on has been your grandfather telling you that it's the devil's lettuce and you'll ruin yeah, your yeah. life getting involved with it kind of a situation. Being able to kind of bring that closer to home for those individuals so they can relate to someone directly that shows like, Hey, there is benefits to it. It helps with anxiety, PTSD. It's changed my life and they can actually create that social bond. And I think that's the only real mechanism to try. It to is. And what's so cool it. about what, what's so cool about that marketing tactic and just that tactic in general is that you can create so much subsidiary content from that, like breaking down the science behind the cannabinoids you're talking about that help in that that person's particular situation or the, the cannabinoid and terpene inter interaction that they're experiencing and why, and that's why they're helping in that. And then that's a whole nother podcast. That's a whole nother blog. You know, having that type of information like readily available for people is really making like all of the difference for, 
you know, every, every aspect of someone's marketing platform, but especially in, in the industry that we're in. Um, and they, it's funny. Like I, I just read, I, it's funny, I've been reading podcasts lately, which is super weird. I read all day, but, uh, I'm like, I'm like into listening to music and reading the podcast. It's, don't do it. But, um, I read this pod that yeah, it's not smart, but, uh, I read a podcast, my friend, Lisa Buffo, who's the CEO of uh, the cannabis marketing association. You guys should totally have her on here. Um, but she, she kept referencing replacing the wine glass with the joint. And that's like another, you know, from like uh, content and like marketing and social perspective, that's something that like we're really trying to do with a lot of these brands because, you know, the female consumer and the, uh, you know, elderly consumer are the two, you know, continue to be since I've gotten in industry, the largest influx of consumer um, in the industry. Um, so that's a huge, that's like another thing too, is like breaking down not only that story and like, you know, turning that into a give back program and changing hearts and minds, but, you know, breaking down the product itself and educating people about it and how they can incorporate it into their lives properly. Um, and like what that looks like and how you can destigmatize the plant through showing people how to incorporate it in a way, you know, by having them watching Netflix with, you know, the joy in their hand or, you know, participating in like other activities and whatnot. Um, like for me, for instance, like, I'm the complete opposite of the guy on the couch being lazy. Like, don't get me wrong. I love to take a dab and watch a great war movie. That's like, you know, guilty pleasure. But I also love to consume cannabis and get really creative. I'm a musician. I'm an extreme sports athlete. I work out almost every single day. Cannabis is involved with every single one of those things. Um, it enhances the experience. And I feel like I get simultaneously better at those things, you know, um, so yeah, it's interesting. And, you know, just, that's just my personal, you know, experience, but I feel like I can help tra help people translate that into their story. They're trying to tell through their marketing. The educational piece is going to definitely be a huge one. And I think for the, the everyday consumer like you, John, I think some people just need to find that right product and have the experience where they can consume it and then go work out because I think some people have this one idea that I consume it and then I go sit on the couch, but there's yeah. this whole nother world of, of consuming cannabinoids yeah, on because, a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, I mean, I think about like, yeah, I used to hit up my drug dealer in Jersey to go buy the weed and he'd be like, it's blue dream. I'm like, it doesn't smell like the blue dream you gave me last time. You know, like you had no idea what you're, for. Like, most people will consume cannabis for the first time in a non-legal state. Like what are you really consuming? what the hell happened to that plant from a pesticide, you know, point of view. Um, you know, if you're eating an edible from, you know, like a lot of my, I see a lot of my friends, like I visit Jersey, they have California products and I'm like, there's no, I'm like, those have labels on them, but there's no lab test information. So like, I want, you know, and I'm like, Oh man, like they're probably just buying products that didn't pass. Like people are just like making money, you know, like it's, it's interesting, like how people stigma can just how can they, there's so much opportunity for it to change now. I mean, you can buy CBD online. <laughs> you know, people still don't even understand how that works. And like, you know, doing the research to find like a great hemp product to help with your anxiety or like your mild pain, um, rather than like taking you know Xanax or you know whatever. You know, a lot of times you don't need it. Um, you know, same thing with with cannabis. I can go to the dispensary right down the street here in Colorado, and I can buy. Yeah, you know, I can, if I had a headache right now, I'd probably go want to get some type of like one-to-one -one edible, um, you know, a, a 10, like a 10 milligram THC, 10 milligram CBD, want a gummy. Oh man, that's like one of my favorite things to do activities on and work out. Cause I know that that specific formulation helps me focus and I don't get that anxiety from the edible, but I get just enough THC to really, you know, get me going. Um, so yeah, and I did, you know, I've just been a consumer forever and I just have the opportunity to go into the dispensary. And if I don't know what I'm doing, I could still reference a bud tender. And fortunately in Colorado, a lot of the brands here are very great at educating consumers. I would say we probably have one of the most educated consumers and also like bud tenders, like, you know, probably in the country from my experience. Um, I've heard, I've, I said that recently on a podcast, someone was like, what? No, I was like, sorry, but that's been my experience. I've gone to like, I think six different, maybe four different States like dispensaries. And yeah, I, I just can, I, that's like where I'm getting that perspective from, but I'll back that anyway. up. I mean, I operated as a, I was in operating in Washington and I was doing vendor days and going to help educate 
Blunt tenders. That was my worst experience. <laughs> it was Washington. Washington days, right? No, no, it was Wash. It was my Washington experience, actually. Yeah, like, it was weird. I had two oh. different. Yeah, every time fish goes to uh, the gorge, I end up going. What to a this place, place, though! Just like quick tangent. How beautiful is the gorge? Like, oh my god! Once in a lifetime. Oh like, man. Yeah, when you first like the first time you like go over the hill and like look out over the stage, it's just like, wow, I'm about to see a concert here. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like sick. <laughs> if I wasn't from Colorado and didn't have like a predetermined Red Rocks is always number one, yeah. the Gorge would be number one. You oh, know? There, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's always a huge debate. Like, yeah, 3 a.m. Oh, after yeah. a show, like, what's better? <laughs> right. But, sorry, yeah, Red Rocks a little special tangent there. spot for sure at this point. <laughs> Do your thing. So I want to kind of push back on one of the uh, one of the comments you said, John, about the idea of like Netflix and sitting on the couch with a joy instead of a glass of wine. There's TV shows that are starting to really come out on Netflix, yeah. like cooking, cooking with cannabis, which is good from like an awareness and exposure standpoint that an at home chef can utilize cannabinoids in their cooking as like an additional way to get exposure to the plant. Do you think shows like that help the stigma? Do you think it has no difference? What's your perspective on that? I think it I think it does help the stigma in a way. I think that you know, I haven't actually watched that one. You know, what I do see and that I do enjoy is that like regular TV shows that I watch that have nothing to do like with cannabis as the main topic. There's cannabis in them now and it's just normalized. And I think that that's really cool. Um some of the TV shows I've seen out there um, I think that it's, I think it does help because it, it, it caters to certain demographics of people that maybe it could change their heart and minds and people who are already educated about, um, cannabis can really learn a lot from the shows and probably incorporate to their lives. But, um, I believe like from that show in particular, I've seen like an episode or two, um, and there probably could be more education, like more intimate, like education involved with that. Um, but I don't know. I'm always just a fan of like normalizing it in general. Um, you know, and again, it's still even surprising to me. Like I never thought that like, that would be a thing on Netflix. You know, what, what are your, what are your guys' perspectives on that? I think it's normalizing it. I think just by even yeah. positioning it on there and having, let's call it the everyday mom who we both agree is the ideal target demo from a marketing sense. If you can get the moms behind it, you've got the most powerful purchasing decision makers on the planet and Dude, moms, that's it. Just- if you can okay. land that one, you've you've hit the holy grail of like perfect, Same perfect, thing with perfect. My life, yeah. you know, yeah. Moms are just everything. That's it's funny as a marketing background, we both see exactly that's the target demo. If we can land that, we've done it. And you know, hopefully, this doesn't go to too many of the moms' heads out there that they're the most powerful decision makers. But it, it is, you know. I, oh, I don't have it still up here on my LinkedIn. I just um, oh, I, headset. Just really, I like headset. They just released um, the California trends of products that females are most likely to buy. And it was really great. Yeah. Um, if you go to their site right now, I think they have the report up. Um, and I, I was just really intrigued because I'm like, yep, like those would be the brands because that's the way they're marketing themselves. What was interesting though is not all of those brands incorporated um, you know, CSR or like a formal give back program. Um, which is something that, like, I think some bigger, you know, bigger brands really should consider considering the amount of power, you know, they have right now um, over people who are already doing that and whatnot. But yeah, that was really that was a really cool report to see because yeah, it's what I'm most intrigued by. And you know, working in, in the industry, like, I work with I think more women than now than men in the cannabis space, and uh, it's great. I mean, it's I think the most female dominated CEO uh, industry in the world, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's insane how many just, just badass females are running companies in the space. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. there's just from true leave to, oh, yeah. I was going to say, we should do a favorite. We should do a quick favorite round. <laughs> I just pulled that. Oh me. man. <laughs> it's tough. That's a, I mean, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, you, Cody Sanchez. That you can he, have multiple favorites. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I like a lot of them. You know? <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's tough, and they're and they're just absolutely crushing it, crushing as it. they should be. Like, I am so grateful that I have females on my team that help provide that perspective because that is who ninety five percent of the time, like our brands are are catering to. 
Um, and it's, it's interesting now, like you see, um, like a really cool marketing thing that we're seeing is like Pinterest is like starting to play this little game with hemp and cannabis. And, uh, there's a lot of success on there for a lot of hemp brands right now. Um, because it's so female oriented because females will go to that for, you know, mood boards, cooking boards, you know, outfits and stuff like that. It's a female centric social platform. So, um, it's been really cool, like utilizing that and seeing certain clients grow, depending on like the type of product that they're offering. Um, we have two clients that we're about to release like a full spectrum, like six to month to a year, like advertising campaign on there. Uh, in the hemp space, there's this like cannabis furniture company we're talking to that I saw the email conversation with Pinterest and it was really weird. The one, the one rep from Pinterest was like, yeah, you can totally advertise this, you know, your, this furniture on our site, even though it's cannabis related, but you know, just don't mention cannabis. And then the next email from the other representative saying, you absolutely cannot advertise your furniture on our platform. Don't say that. And then the next email saying from the other guy, actually, no, you can, you can do it. Just, you know, be careful about how you word it. And then the other guy, you can absolutely like, it's like so <laughs> weird, like to see how these things are like unfolding. And um, like Facebook, I think changes their like, you know, algorithm and updates and how they crawl the pages like every other day. I, I have never, I, I get an email every day from someone trying to get us to get their Instagram account back. Um, cause they, they just did a huge crawl and deleted a bunch of accounts that shouldn't have got have been deleted. Uh, it's really interesting. If For you can reason. figure out, if you can figure out how to get those accounts back, we could add one more to that list. Um, did you lose just, an account? Uh, you know, that's a conversation for maybe an offline one, but uh, that one came down <laughs> yeah, quick and I was a little surprised. I was like, whoa, I didn't realize this was wrong, but you're right. Sometimes they're like, that's the line. And we just moved it over three to the right. And you are now on the wrong side, my friend. And yeah, and I think the most recent one is actually a security update, which I was happy about, like being a recent victim to identity. <laughs> but sure. um, they like you can't start. Like they used to be able to start accounts with your same phone number and email, and they just changed that how they how they do that. So you have to have a separate phone number. It's similar to like actually how TikTok is. Like you have to have a separate phone number and email per account. Um, so when they changed that in their most recent update, like I don't know, two three months ago, I think um, and they just did it again recently. But um, that's actually that new crawl that was put out after that change is what got all these other accounts shut down that weren't even doing anything wrong necessarily. Um, so that's, that's been interesting, like seeing how that's unfolding and um, like, we're getting a flags on posts from like four years ago uh, on Facebook right now. It's like, what? So yeah, I'm actually getting flags on Facebook from accounts that we're not even admins on. That's terrible. Like, because I posted it and it's weird. It's super strange. Let's talk about anchor. If you haven't heard about anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. That's right. No more excuses. Get your lazy ass off the couch. Go start a podcast. There's the creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone with computer. Once again, no more excuses. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. Could it be easier? Even better, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. That's right. They're paying us for this ad. Thank you very much, Anchor. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started now. So let's move Let's move to prediction time. Okay. Where do you want the marketing aspects of the industry to go from a product level standpoint? Obviously, now there's tons of disputes between this strain is good for anxiety or this product is helpful for relaxing. What do you see as the biggest issue in the space and what do you see as the biggest potential growth vehicle for the marketing area? I mean, I think it just, again, comes down to, I think it comes down to a few different things, but a lot of it, again, is just the educational side of things. Like, I think the future of products, in my opinion, is different cannabinoid and terpene interactions. Um, that's what I'm most intrigued by, being like a very educated consumer and someone who markets these things every day. And I think the hardest and most difficult challenge for uh, as a marketer is going to be to bridge that gap where supporting companies who want to have these innovative products, which we do. And we have, we have clients who are really pushing the envelope on ingredients and 
just flat like their flower that they're putting out which i think is the most important part um but i think that's a huge factor um i think p- educating people on the importance of like you know re- reusable pa- like renewable packaging sustainable packaging is a huge factor with products um and again like what are you doing with those funds and like how are we incorporating that in the community um that's a future i want to see for products and the challenge here for us the future of marketing is bridging that gap and like making that education very digestible for the consumer so we can really find the people that actually need it or at least if you don't necessarily need something for a direct like medical um problem you know something that like you're comfortable with consuming to just help with the day-to-day life in 2021 you know um that's the type of people i'm trying to help here is the people who really need it and deserve it um and yet like could depend on it as like an alternative to so many other types of medicines and forms of you know pharmaceutical drugs um and then yeah just like my friends and family who might just be stressed out with their work day you know it's stressful just being (laughs) running a business or doing whatever in this world you know it's i feel so bad for everyone you know just i have horrible stress levels and it helps with me so much um really grateful again like to be working with great companies and have access to like great products um, and just go to some of the best dispensaries like in the world. It really changes my life, you know, it's, and it's all we're trying to do is change others <laughs> to be really blind. That's it. You know, well I, hope that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Kellen. Being more of on the science side, I'd like to see just more, more evidence that supports all of these anecdotal claims. I mean, I personally, totally. thinking, right. Like there are certain strains that give me anxiety. There's certain strains when I smoke them, I am a completely different person, right. Dealing with stress, all those other things. And like, it's one thing to be like, no, this is how I feel. And right now there's just, there was a huge blackout on the scientific research. Right. And so that marketing perspective is like, you're standing on these annual total claims that a lot of it, it's hard to generate that trust. But as you see the science hopefully come in and provide more robust evidence that then you can be like, no, like, look, this is exactly why I'm feeling this yep. way. And, and again, like, that's, oh, that yeah, it's like, to my point, it's like, and then taking that information and just making it digestible for people who don't understand, like, I'm sure we can get into like the nitty gritty of like cannabinoid and endocannabinoid science, but like people be like, what? You guys still talking about weed? Like what? <laughs> no, like I, that happens to me like all the time. I mean, they're like, wait, what are you talking about? <laughs> what about think, you, Brian? I think that's what makes marketers' job right now basically impossible. You walk into a dispensary and there's 30 different types of flour with ridiculous names. You, you want to take an edible. There's all these different names. You, you're kind of overwhelmed from the experience. And as a marketer, our job if the brand is doing theirs is to make sure that we're accentuating the characteristics and telling the story. And if you've got the best product in the entire world, but you can't communicate exactly the benefits of it and it doesn't stand out, people aren't going to try it. And that's going to really be an issue. And there's so much advancement from an educational standpoint and from a communication standpoint. I think marketers are in the hardest position of trying to balance both sides. 100%. As well as accomplish the goal, which is to satisfy the client, but the client wants to make sure their products sell which sometimes puts the marketer in the most challenging of situations. Well, here's a really interesting, um, what I, from my experience, and I think this is true, like when you think of like liquor in like a small batch, right? That's like the best, you know, it's like very concentrated. There's a lot of love pouring into it. When you look at cannabis, the best products I've ever had are these family owned companies who have been farmers for 50 years, and they don't have the money to compete with the big guy who just came in here and white labeled, you know, with four different growers and like his branding looks up on the shelf. Um, so that's another challenge that like we really try to help bridge those gap for the people who have the best. Like I, I truly believe our one client has the best flower in the world. Like it's the, it's the most sustainable. There's, it's hundred percent sustainable, zero carbon footprint and it's outdoor weed, but the, the testing levels, the THC tests higher than indoor weed and it tests higher for rare cannabinoids like CBG, CBN, THCA, higher than anyone. And the terpene levels are above like 2%, like 3%. It's like insane. Uh, so all around, it like, but they're, it's a husband and wife and they're struggling getting their, light, their, their licensing for their larger grow because they don't have the 
enough legal power to push that forward, even though the whole world should probably be doing exactly what they're doing. They should, they, they probably should be setting a standard here. Um, but those are limitations that like, I think a lot of these brands face who are doing it the right way. Don't get me wrong. I think there's some, I think there's a lot of great, like, a lot of the, especially in Colorado, like I'm impressed with a lot of the facilities, a lot of the products that are being pushed out. But when you like really peel back the onion layers and look down to like what I mentioned, like the future of like the products and like infusing the terpene, terpene cannabinoid and sustainability and all incorporating all that into one, um, it's a, it's a struggle. It's, it's hard. Like you said, it's like, even if you're marketing for someone who has a ton of money or the other end, someone who has a great product and no money, it's, you're faced with a, with a challenge here. So it makes that educational standpoint and bridging that gap just so much more important, um, more so than I think any other industry probably. Absolutely. And especially now more than ever. So we're going to wrap with yeah. one last question. We asked this to everyone. When was the last time you consumed any cannabinoids? This morning. I did a, I did a D8 uh, product review uh, for one of our clients. So I am like two vape hits and a 25 milligram DA edible in right now. Um, and that was like two hours ago. <laughs> well, and yeah, like I, you know, I feel, I'm not, I, you know, I feel fine. Like I'm not like, it's really nice. Like we'll have to have a separate D8 podcast, but yeah, definitely can. <laughs> yeah, that was the last, those were the last cannabinoids that entered my body <laughs> two hours ago. Cool. So for the people that are interested from a marketing sense, from an educational sense to kind of get involved with some of the CSR you're doing, where can the listeners find you? Do you have any social handles or any other ways to communicate with you? Yeah. I mean, my, my handle and everything is just John shoot J O H N S H U T E underscore. Um, everything's on our puff creative site and social, uh, P U F C R E A T I V, um, puff creative.com. Uh, you'll find everything about all of our community work, our programs, our nonprofit, some case studies, all the services we have, some of the awards we've won. Um, and yeah, again, like I would really tune in. We just launched our, our video podcast. I think next week we're going to post our first video. Um, so a lot of really fun stuff going on. Stay tuned for those guides. Um, those are going to really make a big splash, I think. So thank you guys so much for having me, by the way. Awesome. We appreciate it. We'll link them all up in the show notes and share all the information and look forward to having another conversation, maybe a little D8. We'll all take them at the same time and yeah. share our experiences. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Sounds good, guys. Thanks, Thanks for so your much. time, John.